Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our seminar, Protecting the Public Record Models of Best International Practice. My name is Orla McBride, and I'm the director of the National Archives. And we're really delighted to have so many of you here this morning with us on this webinar. Over 500 people registered to attend this morning's um, webinar, with the attendees really reflecting the internationalism of the uh, panel that we've assembled. So welcome all. We hope you ha you'll be challenged by this morning, um, but also that you'll learn much from the contributions uh, from our panelists. We have four speakers this morning, followed by a Q&A. And I would ask that people store up their questions and we will finish with the Q&A. Um, just in relation to that, the chat and the raise hand function that we've all become so familiar with in the world of Zoom, just to say that these won't be in operation during the seminar. So all comments, questions, observations should be put in the Q&A box and we'll come to those at the end. Uh, we'll have a short break from 10 20 to 10.30 for 10 minutes, um, and then we will continue with our contributions. Also, just to say that the hashtag that we're using today is protecting public records. So our panellists this morning, we have four speakers. We will start with my colleague Neve MacDonald, who is senior archivist here at the National Archives. We will then move to the Southern Hemisphere and Stephen Clark, who's staying up very late with us this evening. We appreciate that, Stephen, who is Chief Archivist with Archives New Zealand. We will then move to our near neighbours, um, to Dr Hugh Hagen, who's the Head of Public Records Act Implementation at the National Records of Scotland. And finally, we will move across to Denmark to Paul Olsen, um, who is Chief Counselor and Data Protection Officer with Danish National Archives. We always say that despite uh, popular opinion, archives are about the future rather than the past. And I hope this morning we will begin to challenge those notions really in terms of how do we protect the contemporary record that's created today to ensure it's um, protected and valued into the future. So today really is about a discussion on issues relating to how public records are managed, the infrastructure, the processes, the systems and the legislations that underpin and support that management. So as I said we can ensure that appropriate records of value that are created today are protected into the future. We don't have all the answers um, and that's why we've brought so many people here this morning to begin to collectively learn from each other um, and I think assembling such a diverse panel from different countries around the world will hopefully allow us to hear from um, different models of practice. Before I hand over to our first speaker, I think that there are some common challenges that exist for all national archives and bodies that are charged with managing the public record on behalf of its citizens, which I suspect all of our speakers will address in some form or another this morning. First, the statutory basis on which many national archives were established provides a framework for access to the public record, as well as providing for the management of records across government. Often bodies such as the National Archives were established as much to be repositories for historical state records as they were to manage the contemporary records that are being created across government today. And as we live through such significant change in terms of technology, in terms of digital transformations, information management um, and how public records are being created, we need to ask questions as to whether our infrastructures and our legislations are fit for purpose in terms of managing those records today and into the future. Also, many of us were established before data protection, GDPR, freedom of information, all of those um, interventions that were, were developed by the state to ensure greater access and transparency for the citizen. And how do we reconcile um, our foundational legislations um, and, 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 and the rights of the citizen? And finally, from an Irish perspective, with many government departments and um, agencies either not meeting their obligations under the National Archives Act in terms of transferring records or many that have been established since our uh, National Archives Act of 1986 so those records don't fall under our legislation. How do we ensure um, and how do we facilitate best practice records management across government to enable the proper transfer of records and allow the access and openness that was intended by our establishment um, and has been reinforced with greater emphasis in recent years. So I think those are some of the challenges that I know we have in Ireland um, but I rather suspect um, that are common across uh, the, the different jurisdictions that we will hear from today. 
So I'll say nothing more. I'm going to hand over now to our first contributor, um, who is Niamh MacDonald, who is Senior Archivist here at the National Archives in Ireland. Thanks, Orla. So my talk will assess the National Archives Act 1986 and a number of the practical issues resulting from changes in record keeping practices and technology since its enactment 35 years ago. So the National Archives Act 1986 repealed and replaced the statutory system for the preservation and maintenance of state records that had been in existence for more than 100 years and amalgamated the Public Record Office and the State Paper Office to form the National Archives. This act provided a statutory basis upon which the public could access records over 30 years old and also placed an obligation on all government departments, court offices, commissions and tribunals of inquiry and bodies listed in the schedule to the act to provide for the transfer of their records to the National Archives and to seek authorisation from the Director of the National Archives before disposal of records could take place. A departmental record was defined as any record in any format made or received and held in the course of its business by a Department of State. The Act was seminal in facilitating access to records which had been closed or restricted since the foundation of the State in 1922. Prior to its introduction, the state had continued to operate under the terms of the 1867 Public Records Ireland Act, which was largely focused on legal records and made no provision for the protection of departmental records, as it was introduced during a period when the administration of Ireland was predominantly undertaken from London. Despite a number of attempts to introduce legislation in the intervening years, no change had taken place and it was only as a result of the personal interest of the then Taoiseach, Dr. Dr. Garrett Fitzgerald, along with pressure from academics seeking access to records and increased storage costs within departments, that change was introduced. The 1986 Act is a fundamentally sound piece of legislation, but it now requires review. Many weaknesses have become apparent in the practical implementation of the legislation. The lack of any statutory authority for the National Archives to intervene before records reach 30 years old fails to take a broader life cycle approach to information management across the civil and public service. The original emphasis in the legislation was purely on the creation of a National Archives as a repository for, for historical records to facilitate access by academic historians. In 2021, academic historians now account for a small percentage of our users, yet the perception of the National Archives as a repository for dusty documents has continued. A civil service is a reflection of the society it serves. The records created as part of the interaction between citizens and the state and between the various agencies of the state has altered fundamentally in that time to reflect these wider societal changes. Ireland is no longer a largely homogenous nation on the periphery of Europe, but a multicultural and multi-ethnic society. Advances in technology have also radically altered the way in which the business of state is transacted. The only reference in the current legislation to born digital records is the definition of a departmental record in Section 2, which, which makes reference to machine-readable formats. Archival legislation has also failed to keep up with broader legal responsibilities for the protection of the rights of citizens. The current Act predates both freedom of information and data protection legislation, which have altered the way in which citizens can access records less than 30 years old and the relationship between the state and its citizens. The National Archives Amendment Act 2018 introduced no changes to the 1986 Act beyond reducing the 30-year rule to 20 years, initially only for records relating to Anglo-Irish affairs to bring us in line with changes that have been underway on a phased basis in the UK for the past 10 years. In January 2022, the National Archives will release eight years of Anglo-Irish records, including records relating to negotiation and signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Section 8 of the National Archives Act provides for the transfer and release of records to the National Archives when they are 30 years old. This provision does not make transfer of records mandatory as there is no sanction for non-compliance, with the result that most departments and bodies subject to the Act have failed in their obligations. Only two departments of state, the Department of Taoiseach and the Department of Foreign Affairs, 
and two scheduled bodies, the Office of the Secretary to the President and the Office of the Attorney General, are fully compliant with their obligations to release records. In 1992, the then Taoiseach Albert Reynolds made a directive under Section 8 of the National Archives Act that the records of 35 bodies listed in the schedule to the Act should not be transferred until the Taoiseach was satisfied that arrangements for, for such transfer were adequate. A directive that was originally intended as a temporary measure in order to provide time for adequate resources to be put in place within departments and the National Archives continues in force. This directive has effectively introduced a get out of jail free card for those departments and agencies to adequately resource the management of their records and has facilitated the continued under resourcing of the National Archives. While some agencies listed in the 1992 directive have transferred records in their intervening years, most, most have not. For many departments and agencies, 1992 is the last year in which any substantial transfer to the National Archives has taken place. Section 82 of the 1986 Act provides for the retention of records within departments that are still in current use when they are 30 years old. Where records are retained under Section 82, departments are obliged to facilitate public access. Section 84 allows for the withholding or abstraction of records over 30 years old in very specific circumstances as set out in the Act. This provision recognises that circumstances will arise where closure of records is necessary. This may include data protection, information given in confidence or issues of national security. Where records are not transferred to the National Archives after 30 years, departments must apply to the consenting officer in the Department of the Taoiseach for authorisation. In reality, very few comply with these obligations. The Director of the National Archives, as a statutory office holder, has no role here. Although review of withholding and abstraction of records is supposed to take place every five years, this rarely happens in practice. There are currently no limits on how long records can be withheld. The periodic review of decisions under Section 84 should be mandatory, with a failure to review leading to a lapse in certificates. The 30-year rule was introduced for good reason. For any decision to retain or withhold records must fully comply with legal requirements and must not be dependent on decisions of individuals or available resources. After 30 years, the default position should be release unless it can be clearly demonstrated that derogations allowed for under Section 8 apply. This neglect of obligations under the National Archives Act has led to the creation of massive backlogs of records within departments. Pressures on accommodation, which were frequently mentioned as part of the background to the original legislation, are again driving much of the conversation. The National Archives is often only consulted when office space is required and an assumption is made that our only role is to rubber stamp decisions already taken within departments. Paper records are often sent to commercial storage with little assessment of content or whether records are eligible for either transfer to the National Archives or disposal where they hold no archival value. The lack of adequate resourcing within departments to information management and to the National Archives is a false economy. Money is being spent, but not in any coordinated way. This result is that the interests of citizens and those of the state are placed at risk in the short and medium term, with consequent loss to the administrative and historical record of Ireland. This neglect has also reduced compliance with record keeping obligations under data protection and freedom of information legislation. Lack of proper, proper records management and oversight is regularly cited as an issue in the annual reports of the Information Commissioner and commissions and tribunals of inquiry established over the past 20 years. The National Archives Act places no legal obligation on departments to dispose of records, but Section 7 provides for destruction of departmental records that do not warrant retention as archives. Disposal is a routine part of records management and not all records created by the civil service should be retained permanently. This is the only provision that allows for early intervention by the National Archives before records are 30 years old. Statutory responsibility for records management in the civil service currently rests with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. The National Archives can and does provide guidance to departments and agencies, but there is no obligation on this guidance to be complied with. This is a historical legacy with background discussion of the 1986 Act clearly demonstrating that the new institution was principally formed to appease academic interests and not to provide input to broader issues of data governance and information management. 
Section 19 of the National Archives Act and Section 8 of the Freedom of Information Act 2014 allow the Minister for Public Expenditure to introduce records management regulations, but these have never been implemented. Lack of good record keeping practice has inevitably led to retention of records beyond their business use, even where they hold no archival value. In the absence of any clear practical guidelines and regulations to standardise practice and make certain record keeping obligations compulsory, there has been a neglect of records management throughout the civil service. While some departments and agencies have maintained good practice, the majority have allowed traditional registry systems and classification schemes to be replaced by a proliferation of ICT-led solutions and no standardised approach to the capture of information. Good practice where it exists needs to be formalised and made obligatory to ensure a systematic approach is followed. The National Archives has attempted within limited resources to be proactive in the Im implementation of Section 7. Through my work in overseeing records appraisal and applications for destruction of departmental records, I have seen firsthand many of the practical consequences on the ground. Much of my work takes place off-site within departments and storage facilities. This hands-on approach is necessary to help departmental staff to deal with the consequences of decades of neglect. It provides an important link between the National Archives and staff on the ground. In the course of this work, the National Archives has become aware of a number of circumstances of unauthorised destruction of records. This has largely resulted from a lack of resourcing and training of staff with responsibility for records, including awareness of the National Archives Act and their obligations. Any review of the Act should make it an offence to destroy records and to prescribe penalties for the unauthorised or wanton destruction of records. It is an offence under Section 18 for members of the public to destroy or interfere with records already transferred to the National Archives, but the same standard does not apply to civil servants. The Open Data Directive, which is due to come into force in July, is likely to increase pressure on already overstretched resources. The application of data protection legislation is also concerning. Derogations for archiving purpose in the public interest, historical, statistical and scientific research are set out in Article 89 of GDPR. These derogations, which have been included in the Data Protection Act 2018, recognise that personal data is often key to the viability of scientific and historical research and in demonstrating accountability and transparency. In the absence of a records management infrastructure within the civil and public service, it has become apparent that there is lack of understanding as to how these derogations apply. Consideration of data protection in isolation to the wider legal framework within which civil and public servants operate has led to inconsistencies in the application of the law. Where records are managed in a coordinated and systematic way, many of the concerns surrounding retention of personal data and access to information are overcome. Data protection is a fundamental right that we as European citizens enjoy. Its origins in the wake of World War II and the devastating fallout from the misuse of power needs to be understood and acknowledged. It should not be viewed as a burden to be circumvented and overcome, either through destruction of records or denial to, of access to individuals of their own information. These derogations apply beyond government and it is likely that community and business archives, which have traditionally played a key role as sources for social, political and economic history, are likely to be non-existent or to be less rich in years to come. The National Archives, through its business records survey, has saved thousands of collections, including many significant hospital collections from destruction, but pressures of accommodation in recent years has limited our ability to be proactive. GDPR has re reinforced the need for our authority to oversee destruction of records under Section 7. Since 2018, the National Archives has issued 90 disposal certificates for records in both paper, paper and digital formats. A full audit trail of these decisions exists. More significantly, we have refused authorisation in eight cases, largely due to the fact that the applications were made on the basis of concerns over GDPR compliance, with no thought to the broader context within which records were created and the functions they support. A number of disposal authorisations were also refused, as no identifiable filing structure was in place, making it impossible to identify archival from non-archival records. The absence of records management regulations is having a knock-on effect in many areas beyond archives and is directly impacting the ability of civil servants to carry out their work in an efficient and effective manner. Information cannot be viewed solely from one perspective. 
A standardised and standards-based approach to information management and data governance is central to wider compliance with record-keeping obligations under various legislation, including archival legislation. There needs to be recognition that this area requires specialist skills and knowledge to deal with the complex nature of information management in the modern digital age. A multidisciplinary approach involving information professionals alongside specialist ICT personnel is required. At present, records management is generally tagged on to FOI or data protection units, which are already under-resourced and overburdened. Civil servants with responsibility for information governance rarely receive adequate training. It is impossible to fully address these issues where personnel are not appointed on a full-time basis. The current disconnect between paper records as a facilities management issue and digital records as an ICT issue needs to be addressed. During the 12 and a half years I've worked in the National Archives, I've been employed by seven different departments. Our parent department has become the Lanigan's ball of the civil service. Sport steps in and heritage steps out again. While transfer of functions may seem to outsiders as a minor change to headed paper and logos, the practical implications are far more reaching. The loss of institutional knowledge through staff changes can negatively impact the provision of service and the continuity in record keeping. Legal responsibility for records transfers with each change, yet in reality only records still in current use actually move. This is creating difficulties as departments that are actually storing records have no legal authority to either certify their release and transfer to the National Archives or to apply for their disposal. This has further added to the backlogs mentioned previously. A civil service is a hierarchical structure and your position within that hierarchy directly affects your ability to influence decisions and policy development. The position of the National Archives as a business unit within a department constantly undergoing change has not served its interests or the interests of citizens well. The National Archives, as the final curator of the nation's historical memory and archival heritage, should be centrally placed to influence governance and management. This quote was taken from the 2001 Director's Report, is as applicable today as it was 20 years ago. Despite repeated calls for intervention, the National Archives continues to have no capacity to accept transfer of digital records. This is in contrast to our colleagues in Denmark who are leaders in the field of digital preservation and have accepted digital records into their custody since 1970. Our inability to accept transfers of digital records combined with a lack of digital preservation strategy for the civil and public service makes it all but certain that there has been an irretrievable loss of some public records. Without any statutory ability to intervene before records are 30 years old, this situation will only get progressively worse. The imminent transfer of records up to 1998 makes this all the more urgent. While plans underway to develop a modern repository on the site of the National Archives will go some way to alleviate pressure on the storage of paper records, provision must also be made for the development of a digital repository for the National Archives. It is not feasible to wait 30 years to capture records created in digital formats. Many National Archives have strict protocols around the use of ICT systems and have specified or preferred standards and file formats that must be used in order to reduce the risk of loss of information. In Ireland, the National Archives has had no input to the development or operation of the Build to Share programme or to any national data policies. This lack of a statutory role for the National Archives in data governance is a major weakness to the current legislative framework. The civil and public service is not a homogenous static entity. As society changes, so too does the types of functions, records and formats that it supports. The current act, which lists 61 bodies in its schedule, is too narrowly defined, with the result that archival legislation has not kept pace with societal change. Over 150 public bodies, most created since 1986 and including cross-border bodies established under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, have no legal protection for their records. They have no statutory obligation to provide access to their records beyond FOI and data protection, no obligation to transfer records to the National Archives and no obligation to seek authorization from the Director of the National Archives before disposal of their records takes place. These bodies include agencies in all areas of government, but particularly health, education, finance and agriculture. Many of these bodies have played central roles in major events in Irish history. 
in Irish society in recent times. When the history of the banking crisis or how we dealt with the COVID pandemic are written, what sources will be available? Will concerns about data protection and storage have taken priority over longer term issues in the absence of any obligation to comply with archival legislation? While the National Archives has accepted records from a number of bodies not subject to the Act, this has largely been done as a last resort to ensure their survival. This situation creates unnecessary legal complications around issues of ownership, access and copyright, which are all catered for where bodies are subject to the Act. The outsourcing and pro of processing and storage is also a concern. Many departments and agencies outsource activities to private entities. While data sharing agreements are common, what is less common are longer term considerations of the ownership and the protection of the public record. Digital preservation strategies are rarely put in place to maintain digital records beyond business functions. Access to third party records is not obligatory, despite the fact that the state has funded their creation. Paper records are often stored in substandard accommodation, while digital records are now frequently outsourced to cloud storage providers. We have little, learned little from our past experiences. This over-reliance on commercial and off-site storage has facilitated the neglect of proper records management policies. Instead of implementing data governance policies from the outset, records have simply been moved off-site or to deep storage, once no longer required for current business use. No policy exists for the protection of public records in the event of the privatisation of public bodies. National Archives has launched a strategic plan setting out our aims for the next five years. A review of the National Archives Act is essential if we are to be successful in our ambitions. Urgent measures are required to ensure the ICT capacity of the National Archives is expanded and their digital repository developed. This needs to be accompanied by a digital preservation strategy for the civil and public service. The scope of the legislation needs to be expanded to ensure all current and future public bodies are subject to some oversight of their records. Records management regulations which provide a statutory role for the National Archives must be introduced. This will formalise records management and data governance strategy strategies across the civil and public service and will ensure the National Archives, as the final curator of this information, is included in policy development. As archivists, we're privileged to be part of a wider international and knowledge sharing community. Today's event provides us with an opportunity to listen and to learn from the experiences of our counterparts in New Zealand, Scotland and Denmark. By learning from their experiences, we will be in a stronger position to progress. And I'd like to sincerely thank our speakers for being so generous and giving up their time today. So, Mila Boikas. Thank you very much, Niamh. Um, I think she's certainly um, given us much food for thought as we start this morning's proceedings, um, certainly in terms of, of challenging the life cycle approach to records management um, and, its gov and their governance and ensuring that organisations such as the National Archives are involved in, um, in discussions from, uh, about the creation of records and not just coming in um, after 30 years, but also recognising that a whole of government approach is what is required to records management. Also, the digital, um, uh, the digital challenge, the creation of a digital repository, how do we ingest digital records, um, and finally looking at compliance uh, with the National Archives Act. Um, how do we ensure that those departments and agencies that should be transferring records across to the National Archives, um, that, that they do so, but also how do we comprehend the many agencies um, and, uh, of the state that are outside of the current National Archives Act to ensure that the records that are being created by them over decades are not lost completely to, um, to the citizens. So we will now move on to our second contributor, who is Stephen Clark, who is Chief Archivist with Archives New Zealand. Um, and we are so delighted to have Stephen with us today and we genuinely appreciate the fact that um, there is such a significant time difference. So, um, Stephen, thank you very much. Um, and I'll hand over to you now. Morena, ina mana ina na reo, ina karananga tanga, maha tanakoto katoa. Good morning, good evening from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, that was um, that was a, a little greeting and. Te Reo Māori, we are a bilingual institution, so 
I'm Stephen Clark, Chief Archivist of Archives New Zealand, Te Ro Mahara o Te Wakana Kanatanga. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the Public Records Act here in New Zealand. Um, but first of all, I'll just introduce myself. It's traditional in Maori custom to introduce yourself and who you are and what your tribal background is. So I'll introduce myself in customary fashion. So, Tihe Maori Ora, ko koith pechren kin teo te maunga, ko loch duich te roto. Ko clan Cameron, ko clan Makingi na iwi, ko Makiri, ko Makingi no Kenteo na hapu, no te Fenu Katamana aho, ko Stephen Makanshi no Kiri aho, ke Papau Puri matoa taku tuuranga mahi, ko Stephen Clark toko Angawa, no rena tena koto, tena koto, tena tatau katoa. Um, so I'm just quickly uh, seeing who it was. My tribal affiliations um, are. Clan Cameron, Clan Mackenzie, and my grandfather was a McCleary from Dublin, so uh, an Irish connection there, and a little bit about um, uh, placing myself in the land and, and in the context as we, we do in, in Maori culture. And um, I think perhaps one of the things that might be unique about our legislation is that it has um, a bilingual and bicultural component to it, and we are bound by law to meet the treaty obligations of uh, Te Riti o Waitangi, which was um, a document from 1840 signed between the United Tribes of uh, Mauridom in New Zealand and the Crown. So um, we serve not only um, the Pakeha, the white population of New Zealand, but also are specifically bound to represent our uh, Maori and um, tribal um, stakeholders as well, which might be might be a bit unusual in European context, but I just thought I'd throw that in there as an opening gambit. Um, so uh, we are um, based in Wellington as a head office, but we have uh, three other sites in Auckland and in the South Island and Dunedin and Christchurch. That's just a, a picture of our, uh, you've got to have a picture of the stacks. So that's, that's the picture of the stacks from Wellington. Um, so a little bit by the numbers, we have around about, um, pushing on for 150 kilometers of storage in those four buildings, about eight, 8 million individual archives, um, around about 5 million page views of our digital material, which we put out on our, on our um, online finding aids. Um, we've did, we've uh, ingested a pushing half a million digitized um, archives from our collection onto our online services. And actually in that time, We've been supporting the Royal Commission into Abuse and State Care in, in New Zealand. So we've actually digitized um, almost a million documents for that, that court case, which is a which is a huge uh, Royal Commission underway at the moment. And uh, um, I, I, I guess a function that we weren't necessarily seeing ourselves doing and, and came to us quite late in the piece, but it's meant we've had to really ramp up our uh, digit digitization uh, team and our capability. And what we've digitized so far it covers about 15% of our holdings in total, but at, at current rates of digitization, it will take us 200 years to do all of it. And of course, they keep creating more of it. So um, a little bit of context of where our legislation came from was that there was a series of fires, floods, shipwrecks, and earthquakes across the country throughout the 19th into the 20th century, which have a, had a huge impact on the um, archives and records of, of New Zealand government. Um, and through the series of those, that eventually it became a point that after a particularly um, damaging fire in the Hope Gibbons building in, in Wellington, which, which was the main storage unit for government archives in New Zealand, um, finally there was the final straw. There was a, there was a Royal Commission and the um, 1957 Archives Act was passed. Um, and kind of maybe a little interesting... Um, Side issue was that in, so in the 1860s, the capital moved from Auckland to be uh, into Wellington to better uh, be reachable by the early emerging railways of the South Island where the gold fields were and where a lot of the money was back in the 1860s. And so a ship full of politicians and the archives came down from Auckland to Wellington, but was wrecked on the way. And um, at that point, they started throwing the archives over the side of the ship and the hope that they would float towards the shoreline. And of course they did, but they were last seen floating towards the shoreline of Chile, uh, 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 yet to be recovered. So um, 
I think there's a bit of a theme there that there were certain disasters, uh, both natural and uh, man-made, that meant that, the, that eventually there was a decision that something had to be done. So the Archives Act of 1957 was put into place. It was based on legislation that had been enacted in, in South Africa, uh, another um, former uh, British colonial um, office. And um, we established um, essentially the National Archives, Archives New Zealand as it, as it now is, uh, uh, in Wellington and then those, those satellite offices and started to put legislation in that bound government to transfer information centrally to Archives New Zealand and a purpose-built, um, or the idea was a purpose-built repository which would hold all that centralised on behalf of all, all New Zealand, for, for all New Zealanders for access. However, um, by 2000, the evolution in government, the scale of government, it had changed radically from those, er those earlier days and it was just seen that the, the act was, was too constraining and not actually fit for purpose for the modern era. So a, a new uh, Archives Act went through uh, Parliament and um, was, was intended to, to an extent, uh, be a reaction to new technologies and the new ways that, that government was working. And the sheer scale of records that were being produced in the newly, um, uh, in the newly emerging digital age. So the Public Records Act, and bill went through Parliament in originally 2003, was enacted in 2005, and it's a regulatory framework for creating, managing, and improving information management across the public sector in New Zealand. Um, and what we're really here to do in many ways is to support our democracy. If you can't hold your government to account, then do you really have a democracy, one could argue, and it's to enhance public confidence and integrity of government, but also within the Act it talks about social um, licence, about national identity um, and about um, redress for uh, Maori um, land that was taken in the, 18, uh, the 18th and 19th centuries um, against that legislation of the Treaty of Waitangi, which I, I mentioned earlier, and um, to protect archive, uh, to protect and archive New Zealand's documentary heritage. So I guess what was what was kind of interesting. Um, it might be interesting for, for, for this audience, is that the definition of a record was deliberately kept as open as possible. And I, and I think what, what would be interesting from that, that step from being broadly seen as the, the other material that's mentioned there, seals, um, paper, images, sound, text, speech, etc., is that specifically mentioned in our act is that the, the, is that the Public Records Act covers data compiled, recorded or stored in a computer or any other electronic um, device or process, which means that, that, that the emergence of things like cloud computing, the emergence of, of new technologies and new ways of, of storing, uh, transmitting, capturing and maintaining information is covered by our legislation and we don't have to, um, don't have to keep complete, uh, com constantly update and change the definition of our, of our legislation. And of course, the paper paradigm is shifted into the, the digital reality for us all now. And the New Zealand government, the kind of the, the accepted date really for that change from being paper into digital was about 1996. Um, I'm not saying that our, our capability to um, ingest digital archives is anything as, as mature as as uh, Denmark, and I'm really surprised this is as early as 1970, which was the year I was born, so that's a very long time ago. Um, we've only really started our digital journey and uh, taking in digital transfers round about um, 2008, and we've still got a long way to go. Um, so I'll be, I'll be very honest about that. We, we lack a lot of maturity and haven't really caught up with the reality of cloud computing within the, the New Zealand government context. However, um, we do have pretty broad coverage. Um, it's, it's broken up into two uh, key areas, although we, um, we use the term public offices within the legislation. What that really means is any, any government agency or any public body which is funded by uh, public money. And um, it, it, it covers roughly 3,000 organisations, which sounds a lot, but the way our, our um, system is set up is that each school has its own independent uh, body of, of commission which which looks after it so about 2500 of those bodies are the are the schools in, in New Zealand 
Um, and out of that other 500, there's about 280 big major public bodies that we cover and have to legislate, audit, um, look after, and um, transfer information and um, papers from into our centralised repositories and to our custody and within our control. It also includes local authorities, which um, I'm sure you'll, uh, in, same in any country, constant um, changing and, and boundaries um, uh, due to um, changing uh, colours of parliament and changing demographics and immigration means that um, at the moment, I think off the top of my head, there's either 67 or 68 uh, local authorities in New Zealand and our coverage of them is, is slightly different. Um, there's different legislation and we're only, uh, we are only allowed to regulate their protected records, which is particular records which are mentioned in their legislation as being um, important from, I guess, a national sig uh, significance. But the Act empowers us to issue criteria for the independent of auditing of public offices. And we do, we audit all public offices in a five-year rolling cycle. So that, that is um, something in the order of about 60 or 70 um, agencies that we audit every year. Um, at the moment, we're not doing it ourselves. We're using um, external auditors to undertake those audits. We train them and, and what to audit on. Um, uh, I must say that from, from my perspective, that that's suboptimal. I'd much rather we had um, our government record keeping staff doing this work and building a portfolio approach with these, those agencies and being there with, with them on the ground while this is happening. Um, we can issue mandatory and discretionary standards. And we have done, we, we've um, over the years, uh, put mandatory standards in for record keeping metadata, um, digitization of records, um, the implementation of electronic records management systems, um, the storage standard. At the moment, they've been amalgamated into one mandatory standard with some supporting dis discretionary standards. But that's something we're looking at at the moment, um, what our standards suite looks like and how we can bring that better into the, the digital age. And that might be things like um, being able to release things like metadata standards as schema or um, or retention and disposal schedules and um, you know as, a, as 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 code you know maybe in JSON or XML or in ways that are much more easily implementable into government systems. <clears throat> we also provided an advice and guidance um, for government agencies, um, topic based often, perhaps a particular piece of guidance on what to do um, in cloud computing or what to do um, in a Microsoft 365 environment or how to manage email or um, or <clears throat> physical storage. So that there's quite a range uh, that we cover there. Um, we conduct monitoring reporting uh, for the compliance of public offices through we do every public office is, is compelled to fill in a self-assessment every year. Um, and we, we collate them together and do a report um, that we publish um, uh, publicly, so that uh, that so that anyone um, can can see what the state of the current state of government record keeping in New Zealand, and we also publish a summary of our audits to our minister through Parliament, uh, and that's that's the, the report on uh, on record keeping compliance uh, within uh, <clears throat> from a statutory perspective, and, and our minister tables that in Parliament. So that's a report to Parliament again. That that's public, and anyone can can look at that. Um, to see where where we are, and that's that's the that's the basis uh, that we have as our benchmarking for how we uh, put our, our our very scarce resources into providing advice and guidance, and how we interact with government agencies on uh, on the tricky business of improving government record keeping across the entire system. There's some other bits and pieces that we do, but that that's that's really the, um, uh, the main ones. Um, we do. Um, we do have the power to inspect public offices if we hear that there's been a, a breach of, of storage, uh, of the storage standard or requirements. Um, we haven't really used that uh, power very much. We do have a, a, a piece of the, uh, uh, power within our legislation to uh, enable what we call approved repositories, and that's third parties that hold records on our behalf. An example of that is we don't really have the resources for sound and vision ar archives, so our equivalent of of the BBC and um, national radio, 
um, we had to take all of their records um, about 10 years ago, and we simply didn't have the, the, the capability to do that. So a separate approved repository was set up called Natalna Sound and Vision, and uh, they, they hold public archives that are, that are audiovisual um, on our behalf uh, as an example of that. So we, we do preserve and provide access to public archives, as I said earlier, our, um, our ability to do digital archives is actually really quite limited at the moment and something that we're, we're looking at and looking at legislatively, how do we move, move to a post custodial model where perhaps we, we do archives in the cloud where the records are, rather than look to a more artisanal um, on-prem um, custodial model within our own servers. I don't think the scale's there for us just by the sheer um, bulk of records that have been created within government. Um, and we do have that leadership role within the profession and um, a leadership role with our peers within the, the broader information and data um, regulatory framework within New Zealand. So we built good relationships with um, the Ombudsman who, who oversees the Official Information Act. Their act has been renewed at the moment. As you can see, it was 1982, so wasn't really fit for purpose in the digital world. The Privacy Act has just been last year renewed in order to bring it up to date with, with how with a post-internet age um, and cloud environments we now, that we now live and work in. And the Statistics Act is going through Parliament at the moment to try and update it. And that's going to be uh, interesting because at the moment, we're the only government body that has a mandate to set mandatory standards for data. Um, and um, the, uh, our, our statistics agency, um, the equivalent of the Office for National Statistics, Statistics New Zealand, um, is seeking to have that power within its legislation and is currently uh, mandated to be the national chief data steward. So it's going to be interesting how we find the boundaries in our area, areas of, of complementary um, areas and um, areas where we might be butting up against each other and how we can work better together. Um, and there, are, there, there's, there's, um, there is a potential for a new digital ombudsman to be put in place for New Zealand as well. So it's actually quite a contested and, and a confusing area for, for government because there are leadership bodies within government for specific record types. Um, so um, inland revenue for, for tax records, um, treasury um, for, for financial records. Um, education for education records, health for electronic health records, etc. So it's 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 quite contested and can be a bit confusing, I guess, if you're out there in government agencies trying to work out who you should go to for advice and guidance. When I think about um, when I look at that legislation and I think to myself, well, what what would we change if we if we were to renew our legislation now? And as I say, although data is covered by um, our legislation, it's, it's not really clear where, where the edges are for, for archives. We do have that role, but we don't necessarily have the staff and the resources to, to enable that or, or um, give effect to that um, in ways that we would like. Um, as, you, as you can imagine, when you're looking at petabytes of, of government um, archives out there, it, and um, and we don't have the equivalent of a 20 year or 30 year rule in New Zealand. Although the act says at 25 years, government agencies must uh, transfer their records into the, the control and custody of the chief archivist. Um, it's, it's widely, I'll be blunt, it's widely flouted. Um, uh, it's uh, certainly in the digital sphere, we are not really able to take digital transfers. So when I look at the last 25 years of, of um, digital information that government's been created, I really do worry, I wonder where it is and are, are we wandering into perhaps a, a digital dark age until we can get uh, get back in control of, of, of genuinely um, being able to hold the national uh, memory of the government record in that digital sphere. Um, we'd like greater clarity on our relationship with local authorities. As I say, it's a little bit um, hazy on where the boundaries are and um, because of that, um, local authorities have tended to do their own thing to an extent, and there are local authority archives. And although we do have some control over that, it's, it's kind of fuzzy and it, it's, um, we don't audit them and we don't have the right to audit them or set. And when it comes to setting standards, 
we can only set standards for those protected records and, and what they actually are is quite contested and, and quite difficult to pin down as, as well. Um, we'd certainly like to reconsider um, the way the access regimes have been created and controlled. As I said, there's no 20 year rule. Um, at 25 years, government agencies must um, state whether a, a record is open or protected, i.e. Um, accessible or closed. Um, that's broadly not done. Um, and um, the, the challenge is that we get, have um, archives transferred to us and that classification hasn't been done. So we then have to, to um, manage that internally and we don't necessarily have the resources to go through that at the granular level that's required when, when you've got big, um, big transfers. Um, I would also, um, also feel that 25 years is woefully inadequate for what we need to do for the digital records uh, out there in, in agency land. Um, 25 years, uh, you know, if, if we wait for 25 years for digital transfer, it quite simply will not exist anymore. So um, I think that's something that has to be looked at with um, with a refreshed eye. And it's something that I don't know that we necessarily have to seek new legislation for that. And we could potentially put new standards and new mandatory standards um, for that in place. But putting standards in place is not something that we can merely do by, by fiat we have to negotiate and, and get agreement with government. And although, um, you know, it's one thing to have legislative powers, it's another to have the um, resource and capability to be able to police them and to give effect to them, um, particularly if government agencies then turn around and say, well, you know, we've got, um, we've got a 30, um, you know, if, if Inland Revenue came to us and said, hey, here's the 30 years of the, the government tax record, you can have it because um, it's costing us tens of million dollars, tens of millions of dollars to manage it. There you go. That's suddenly off our books. We just simply would not be able to do that. So we'll have to think about how we do that from a pragmatic perspective and how we work with our, our, our cloud partners. A challenge for us is that New Zealand hasn't had any onshore cloud provision, all cloud um, materials held in, in data centers in other countries, which makes it quite challenging for us from a data sovereignty perspective. Um, to be able to use the cloud. That hasn't stopped government agencies doing it, of course, but it does mean that it's difficult for us because we can't offshore our storage in the way that um, government agencies can, um, uh, can, can just go ahead and make uh, agreements as they do with their third party suppliers. And although we can do some work to legislate that, um, again, um, we are not the, the bit of government that really has the clout to set those kind of standards and, and, and set those, um, those relationships, that's done by another bit of government, although we are now in the same agency, which is a Department of Internal Affairs and the Digital Public Service sets those all of government standards and um, expectations for how storage is done in the big all of government relationships with um, Amazon and Microsoft and, and Google and the other big players. Um, I mentioned approved repositories there. There's a lack of clarity there. I'd really like to um, bring more clarity to our relationship with those third parties that hold information on our behalf and um, really would like to extend the regulatory tools available. We have recently put um, a, a maturity model self-assessment tool out there to help support those um, self-assessments that we ask government to do on an annual basis. Um, but I would like to, to have a bit, a bit more a bit more teeth in our legislation Although technically anyone um, that disposes of, of information without explicit uh, permission from the chief archivist, and that's every agency must have a retention and disposal schedule, they're not always kept up to date. And as, as we all know, when it comes to platform migrations and, um, and a system change, an awful lot of that material was lost and it's not done in a way that's necessarily well thought through and they don't necessarily have disposal authorization to undertake that disposal. Um, that, that's a challenging area for, for us. And again, we wouldn't necessarily um, have the expertise and the capacity to be able to support that over, you know, those 300 agencies, the, the core agencies that we have to support to do that and not at the scale that they are doing that. So uh, what I would say is in, in summary, Although we have quite strong enabling legislation, we don't necessarily have um, the resources and in-house expertise to carry it out. We're not always taking as, as seriously 
as we might, but, uh, in the same way as perhaps the Ombudsman or the Privacy Commissioner would be taken when we go out to government agencies um, and sort of wave our fingers and, and use our legislative stick. Um, under our Act, um, we can only levy uh, $50 fines for non-compliance um, with our Act. Um, that's We've never actually taken a, a government department to court and, and or fine them for non-compliance. We tend to do it um, through <clears throat> naming and shaming through the, through um, uh, instruments or ad ad advice that we put out into our website and through our uh, annual reports to Parliament and annual reports uh, to the public on the state of government record keeping. Um, so really, it's we, we we live in an environment that's that's permissive, um, and we live in an environment where we have influence rather than power. If, if the truth really be told, be told. So what I would say is it was interesting to hear that the, the overview. From, from the Irish context, I, I guess my caution would be that enabling legislation that has um, offences and penalties within it um, is, is, is not the solution to your problems. You need to be able to be taken seriously by government and you need to have the resources to be able to back up um, and be able to practice what you preach and put out tools there that make, it, uh, make compliance and conformance easy because if you don't make it easy, they simply won't do it. And no amount of stick is going to change the fact that government uh, departments, ultimately, their chief executives make the decisions that they make on behalf of the public and they're accountable to parliament, not to the chief archivist. So um, I guess in summary, that would, that would be my, um, my conclusion is legislation is great, but it's not everything. So with that, I'd like to say, um, na mihi nui, and um, thank you all for, for listening to me here today. Well, Stephen Goromila Mai Huggat, um, thank you very much for that fantastic and fascinating contribution. Um, from our perspective, I think you've, you've raised so many issues that we are grappling with here. And as you say, legislation is not, um, you know, it's, it's not going to solve all of the issues that we have. I mean, I think it really is about the value that we place on the public record. Um, and it's going back to the title of today's, um, today's um, uh, seminar, which is to protect the public record, but also we need to place a value on the public record. And it is that whole of government approach, because often we can be, we can be siloed off and that's oh that's where the records go eventually and we're not part of the conversations that are being had in, in terms of data protection information management and that that whole of government approach um, that I think really is required so you can you can have the, the the legislation there can be teeth within the legislation but actually if you don't have the resources if you're not valued and if you're not part of those bigger conversations be it in relation to cloud storage be it in relation to um, uh, data protection, information management, um, then, as you say, you're not taken seriously. So it is a much more systematic shift in terms of how we all, all understand how we protect, but also how we value the public record. Um, so thank you very much, Stephen. We are going to take um, a 10 minute break now. So it is now 10.29. So we will reconvene at 10.40. Just to say if people want to um, put any questions, comments um, uh, or uh, um, observations that they might have into the Q&A box and we will come to them um, at the end of the session. But just to say, first of all, thank you very much to, to Niamh and to, to Stephen for two fascinating and actually quite complementary presentations, um, but from very different contexts. Um, so we'll reconvene at 10.40 uh, to let everybody go. And unfortunately, we can't all have a cup of coffee um, and a slice of cake together. So we'll see everybody back here at 10.40. Thank you. Welcome back everyone to our seminar Protecting the Public Record Models of International Best Practice. I'm going to hand over now across the water to Dr Hugh Hagen, who is Head of Public Records Act Implementation at the National Records of Scotland.
Okay, I'm hoping everyone can hear me and see my slides. Uh, and good morning, uh, and thank you to my colleagues at the National Archives of Ireland for inviting me to speak and to participate in today's event. Um, I'd like to use the opportunity of participating to demonstrate the broad records management ambitions of Scottish ministers in bringing the Public Records Scotland Act into being. Um, it's a very young act, and we're still feeling our way and learning as we go, and it's a really interesting story. Uh, and I'll talk about and highlight how we are going about implementing the Act to help ensure that progress is made, but also address the background to the Act. Um, this is because the background remains a very major driver for improvement in Scotland. It's what we call our compelling story. It ties in very, very well with the, the words of Stephen uh, Clark just previously about legislation and regulation being important, but can be a blunt instrument. You really need to be able to convince people about what we are doing in the records and information and management uh, archives world as important and serve for compelling stories are really useful. The Act's compelling story is one that will resonate with colleagues from any jurisdiction where vulnerable people have been let down by the state. I'll emphasise the serious point that the Act must work for public records in Scotland, irrespective of who is creating them and where they are being created and held. Scottish ministers' ambitions are big and they are challenging, but culture change is challenging. And that's what this is all about. Um, The Public Records Scotland Act 2011 was key, came into force in, in uh, uh, January 2013, very generally. It's about helping authorities to identify and manage their information assets better. Its broader aim is to better protect the information rights of citizens and to help drive the government's transparency and accountability agenda. Its ambitions is ambitious and it's forward thinking and there is much about the Act that we can and must applaud. But it's important to know and to remember um, that the backdrop to the Act is the experience of looked after children in Scotland and claims by those who depended on that service for their care and well-being of physical, emotional and sexual abuse at the hands of those same services. It's as powerful an argument for records, uh, good records uh, management uh, as I've ever heard. The historic abuse Systemic Review, Residential Schools and Children's Homes in Scotland, 1950 to 1995, or the Shaw Report, was commissioned by Scottish ministers to review what systems, systematic failures existed across the service, following an apology by Scotland's First Minister in 2004 to those who had suffered abuse in care. The experiences recounted by Shaw are compelling examples of how information and records are central to protecting our fundamental human rights. He recorded that thousands of case records were lost or erroneously destroyed, but he also recorded that the review was hampered because the corporate record of those care services, including some of the policy uh, records of central government, were simply not available to him in every case. And it's worth considering for a moment that from the 1930s onwards, um, about 480,000, more than 480,000 young people have been through the care services in Scotland. And some will have had good experiences and will remember their time in care fondly. Others will have been abused and neglected. In common, they all experience the devastating consequences of poor records management. And it is devastating. We know care leavers often don't have access to the sorts of anecdotal information that many of us rely upon to know who we are. Information collected at family gatherings, weddings and funerals and birthday parties. It simply doesn't exist. If they are then denied access to a formal record of their time in care, they have no access to their past. None. No access to their own story. No knowledge of their ethnic, their cultural, their religious backgrounds, no sense of family or community, no information on family medical histories that might become absolutely vital to them in later years. And this has been the case for thousands of care leavers across Scotland, many of whom are still alive and many of whom are still seeking answers. 
and unsurprisingly, many of them have reached the conclusion that not only were the records so unimportant as to merit no proper care, but the young, vulnerable people whose lives were represented in these records were also unimportant and undeserving of proper care. And that's a shocking indictment on our society. Shaw highlighted how records were not afforded proper care, and he pointed to the particular problems that existed where records were created and held by third party providers of the state's care services. He determined that there was nothing that could be called a system to manage and protect records being created by non-public organisations on behalf of public authorities. There was no regard to the records being created, their ownership and the need for them to be subject to robust disposal procedures governed by the commissioning authorities. He urged Scottish ministers to address this as a priority to ensure that records held by private non-statutory agencies that provide publicly funded services to children can be safeguarded. And this is central to our new Public Records Scotland Act. So just very, very, very briefly, what does the Act demand? It sets out very clear requirements for public authorities and for the Keeper of the Records of Scotland, who's the regulator of the Act. In principle among them is the requirement for authorities to prepare a records management plan or an RMP, setting out the arrangements that they have in place to manage the public records. And they must seek the agreement of the Keeper for these plans and these arrangements. And this is the first time in Scotland and across the UK that a piece of information legislation has placed such a specific and direct obligation on public authorities. That's innovative and it's forward thinking and it's very exciting. And I know I've probably been in this job far too long. Um, and it gets even more exciting actually um, because this requirement is further detailed. We're civil servants at the heart and we love detail. Not only must authorities prepare a plan for the Keeper's Agreement, they have to have regard to the Keeper's Model Records Management Plan. And this slide out uh, lays out what the Keeper's Model Plan looks like. It's not a template, it's not a box ticking exercise, it's an annotated list of the key elements that the Keeper considers are essential to good records management. An authority's own plan must include a compliance statement against each of these elements, and these statements must be supported by policies and procedural evidence. To be honest, creating a records management plan is not that difficult. The model plan and associated guidance that the Keeper has created is very helpful. Some authorities who have already got agreement for their plans have chosen to publish them, which is also very useful. And we encourage other authorities who have yet to do it to copy these. And there's always Google. And that's all okay. We don't have a problem with that. We encourage plagiarism for the design of an authority's plan because it stops us reinventing wheels and because it's the evidence under the plan that's absolutely key. The plan must be supported by policies and procedural documentation, which have clearly been subject to the authority's governance processes and which have been authorized by the relevant persons or committees. The quality of the statements and the supporting evidence combined determines whether or not a plan can be agreed by the keeper. And you'll be delighted to know that I do not intend to talk us all through all of these elements listed on this slide. We'd be here until 10 o'clock at night and Stephen's desperate to get these bed, I'm sure. Um, and, and you'll be very familiar with them. I'm sure most of our colleagues will be familiar with these. This is not rocket science. It's basic records management. But there are some elements which are key and I'll highlight one or two of them. The Act requires an authority to name a records manager. That doesn't seem very dynamic and interesting, but it's not enough to demonstrate that there is just a post. We need to know who holds that post, and we need to know that they have records management as a core objective, and that they are supported in developing their skills in that post. And when that person leaves or moves on, we need to know that there are arrangements in place to replace that person. And we expect to be told when that happens. More importantly, the plan must identify a senior management figure who has overall responsibility for the arrangements under the plan. 
these are these these are these uh, arrangements here. These uh, uh, elements are not arranged in any particular order, but it's not an accident that identifying a senior management with responsibility and identifying a records manager with responsibility are number two, uh, one and two on the list. There is a public sector wasteland littered with good ideas, and I think we all know that if we don't achieve senior management, senior management buy-in for our ambitions and our projects, then they can all too easily wither on the vine. So the Act holds a senior manager to account for the plan. This must be someone who has the authority to make things happen, to ensure the provisions of the plan are implemented and updated. It tends to be the chief executive officer or the head of corporate services, or maybe the authority's senior information risk officer. Again, we need names and we need contact details. If we need to speak to someone in the authority about the authority's arrangements, we don't expect to have to listen to the Eagles for half an hour before we get through to someone. Permanent preservation, which is further down the list, uh, is also very, very important. There's no point us all being fantastic records managers and for our authorities to be all brilliant at this at some point in the future if the records of enduring value, which they routinely create, do not find their way into an appropriate archive. And the keeper is the final arbiter under the Act for what constitutes proper arrangements, a key element of which is an authority's chosen archive service. And he looks very closely at this under the plan. And if what he sees as an archive service is not appropriate, then the plan may not be agreed. These elements and the others highlighted in yellow are named under the Act. They're actually specifically mentioned under the legislation. So we have very little room to manoeuvre when assessing their compliance. They must be in place when the plan is submitted to the keeper. We sort of created a road for our own back in the early days of implementing this by referring to these as compulsory uh, because they're mentioned under the Act, when in fact all the elements are compulsory. It's just that some are more compulsory than others. <laughs> the ones coloured in white are not mentioned specifically under the legislation and therefore we've got a wee bit more wriggle room uh, in assessing these under a plan and we can afford an authority additional and more time to achieve compliance under these. You'll notice, however, that I've highlighted one element, public records created or held by third parties in red. And this is one aspect of the model plan and the legislation that I will focus on a wee bit because it's there to address that key recommendation of Shaw about the robust management of public records held by private non-statutory agencies that provide public services to children in Scotland. Scottish ministers um, supported this recommendation and they extended the concept beyond the realm of childcare records. Good records management supports good business decisions. It makes our authorities more efficient and more effective. It supports our ambitions to be trusted by stakeholders. Trustworthy information managed under a robust system is the bedrock of our democracy. And we know that is no exaggeration. And it helps us meet our wider obligations from a regulatory perspective. These are not new concepts. We've had data protection legislation since the 1990s, recently given a big boost by GDPR, and Scotland's FOI legislation was implemented in 2005. Each of these laws can bring stiff penalties, which are powerful motivators for us to get our records and information management right. But they're not foolproof. Some of the newspaper headlines that you're looking at on this slide are very recent. We clearly have some way to go. Regulation is becoming ever more robust and we are increasingly aware of the power of systems to help us manage information. But are we changing the culture of record keeping across the public sector? Because regardless of how good our systems may be, we require human beings to engage with them. And that's where our cunning plan usually fails. So do our public sector colleagues routinely consider the people for whom they create records? Do they think about the fact that the records they create may at some point impact on the rights of an individual or a community within our society? I'm not convinced. If we can still fail to be alert to the expectations of our stakeholders, particularly those in vulnerable situations, 
expectations that are not difficult to comprehend, then we continue to act in ways that could undermine their rights and further erode any trust that exists between them and authority. In this case, of course, uh, we'd expect the provider to ensure that records are up to date. But whose records are they? The care provider? The social services? The local authority? The patient? All of the above in one way or another. There are loads of actors here. But which of them has responsibility for ensuring that these records are managed appropriately? And none of this, I want to make clear, is to say that private and voluntary organisations do not routinely practice good records management. They do. Some of the larger third sector organisations that we have worked with over the past years invest more in their information uh, uh, management than public sector bodies that we know of do. However, if we in the public sector can still get things spectacularly wrong on occasion when managing our own information, how confident can we be about scrutinising someone else's records management? And do these disasters tell us anything about what needs to happen? Sean knew what needed to happen and he convinced Scottish ministers. So section three of our act therefore says that records created by a third party while delivering a function of a public authority are public for the purposes of the act. This is a powerful part of the legislation. For the first time ever, we can use public records legislation to reach into the private and voluntary sectors to safeguard records. It's innovative and it's something about which we should be proud. But we can only earn the right to be proud if it works. Currently, it is for commissioning authorities to manage this arrangement entirely. The Keeper has no authority under the Act to engage with those third parties who are providing the services and who are creating the records. And I'll explain a wee bit about that shortly. There are a number of practical challenges here because this stuff lies in the realm of contractual law and procurement where local authority solicitors and others practice the dark arts. So how were authorities to satisfy the keeper that they had confidence in their third party providers records management? And how were we to help this situation where the keeper has no direct authority over the organisations actually creating the records? This, I believe, is where the Act and the Keeper's implementation process really came into its own. Since 2013, we have realised two things. This Act, like any other, will only work if we make it work. It's a bit of paper with a whole lot of words on it, or it's a whole lot of electronic impulses stored on a server somewhere. Either way, it will wither on the vine if we don't feed it and grow it instead of just marshalling it and regulating it. We also understood it needed to be owned, not by the regulator, the keeper of the records, but by the professional community who depend upon it for the leverage that they undoubtedly need uh, within their authorities to get things done, to promote and support their own compelling stories. Honest and open and meaningful engagement is key to any piece of legislation working. So we talked a lot to our stakeholder colleagues. We host regular workshops and meetings and seminars, and we run a conference every few years. We travel pre-COVID, obviously, to meet authorities on their own turf, and we listen very closely. You have no idea how powerful this can be. Civil servants, and we are at the core civil servants, are not known for reaching out to public authorities to talk to them about the challenges they've got. They're used to just hearing from the centre about what they need to do. We are very visible to our colleagues. We are approachable and we're understanding. And despite all the challenges that we all face, our willingness to engage with one another has allowed us to build trust within our relationships. We also, as necessary, convened larger stakeholder forums to allow us to engage with a large number of colleagues on specific thorny issues like public records created by third party providers. And this image is from one of our most recent forums where colleagues debated the third party 
uh, provision issue. An earlier for such forum led to the development of a practical piece of guidance that has proved very useful to our records management colleagues. Critically, we chose to involve representative organisations from the third sector and we engaged locally with uh, uh, solicitor colleagues in the, in the lo Scottish local authority sector. And the result is the records management draft clauses, which is listed at the top of this slide, um, which set out agreed wording for procurement and contractual documentation around the records obligations of any successful bidder for a public sector contract. And also the Public Records Scotland Act contractors guidance, which is a self-assessment tool, which allows any prospective third party organisation to assess whether it is equipped to meet the records management requirements of a public authority before it embarks on a bidding exercise. So confident were we of this guidance, we presented it to the Society of Local Authority Solicitors and Administrators in Scotland for their approval, and we got it. Notice, however, that this guidance is hosted on the website of the Scottish Council and Archives, not on the National Records of Scotland. This is important. Meaningful engagement and communication is also important. When the Keeper convened a forum in 2018-2019 to help him revise his model of records management plan, Collings took the, the opportunity to revisit what they had previously developed around third party compliance. Colleagues chose to revisit this issue of third party compliance. Isn't that wonderful? I was absolutely bowled over by that. Stakeholders were taking control of this. The result was an updated and more detailed piece of guidance, all of which is available on our web pages, including working examples of practical solutions developed and implemented by authorities over the period since 2013. And they demanded the 15th element on the issue of third party compliance be added to the Keeper's Model Plan. Stakeholders themselves are raising the bar on what it is they must achieve and how best they might achieve it. If I wasn't excited enough about this Public Record Scotland Act malarkey, this forum had me doing handstands. This was clear and positive evidence that our colleagues have taken ownership of this piece of legislation. That's the way I view it anyway. It will live, this act, because it is in the care of those for whom it most needs to work. So we have a relatively new act that I am obviously overexcited about. It's not a panacea for all our pains. We have public sector chief executives struggling to maintain the fabric of their schools, to deliver environmental services, to deliver health and social care to the sick, uh, and to eradicate homelessness. We have hospitals without enough staff and vital equipment and which are chronically under-resourced. These are the priorities of chief executives across the public sector in Scotland and they are real challenges. So we face stiff challenges in straitened financial times, but by harnessing the desire of our records management and archive professional colleagues to make this act work for them, and by being honest about what we can achieve, by not being possessive of the act as a regulator and by engaging with colleagues so we all learn from each other's experience and knowledge, we can work together to affect gradual positive change. But as good as all this is, a flaw remains, in my opinion. You'll recall the slide showing the wonderful third party guidance that we now have, and which is hosted on the website of our colleagues uh, in the Scottish Council and Archives, not the National Records of Scotland. We needed to do this to address the genuine concern of third party providers at the bill stage in 2011, their concerns was that to be associated with a piece of legislation about public records may inadvertently suck them into the world of freedom of information. That gave them the heebie-jeebies. In the end, the Keeper agreed not to liaise with or engage with non-public bodies about the management of public records being created by them. However, eight years after the implementation of the Act, maybe it's time to revisit this. 
not least because in recent years, we have been approached by third party providers looking for the same advice and guidance that we provide to public sector colleagues. And we know that our public sector colleagues are providing that additional uh, advice and guidance to them directly. It appears possibly that the concerns that they had some years ago are now easing off. Anyway, that is something for us to consider in conjunction with our public sector colleagues, and it's something which we will do in a collaborative way. I want you just to read that for a second and think about it. It was Chris Daly who lodged the petition to the Scottish Parliament in 2002, which led to the apology by Scotland's First Minister in 2004, which led to the Shaw Report, which laid the ground for the current Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry. I first met Chris in 2005, and I know that he grew up to be 40 years of age thinking that his mum and dad didn't love him. That they had abandoned him as a child to a life of abuse and loneliness and care. Yet there was a file that explained the circumstances and contained years of love expressed in birthday cards and Christmas cards, postcards, demonstrating that they clearly did care and that revealed that he had siblings, one of whom was actually in the same care facility as Chris for a time, all of whom were unknown to him. He had a family that he should have been part of, but he didn't know and he wasn't told. This takes records management out of the realm of good business practice and regulatory compliance, and it places it firmly in the realm of protecting people's rights. Records are the guarantor of our societal rights and privileges and they demand to be properly managed. I'll conclude where I started with our compelling story. Chris and thousands like him are why what we do is so important and why this act and all our collective endeavours across all our jurisdictions need to work and why scrutiny of how public records are managed wherever and whoever and however they're being created is absolutely essential. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, and from an Irish perspective, even having a further conversation around private and voluntary uh, sector re records, because that's become quite a, a live issue for us here. Um, but just even understanding the learnings that arose out of the historical abuse systematic review in 2007 that led to um, the, uh, the Public Records Scotland Act of 2011. So I think there may be questions in relation to those. Hugh, it is just fantastic to hear someone um, be so excited um, uh, about a piece of legislation um, and to describe legislation as exciting and innovative. I hope someday we'll all be sitting here talking about our legislation as being exciting and innovative. Um, one of the big takeaways, I think, from, from, from your talk, from my perspective, Hugh, is really about the culture of record keeping um, across the, the public sector, that in a way we can have the statutory powers, we can have the systems, we can have the processes. But why actually do we do this? It's about transparency, the principle of, of openness, accountability, but ultimately about citizen rights. Um, and they should always, we should hold those dear, really, in terms of um, across the civil service and the public sector in terms of how we manage and how we're actually creating records um, from the very beginning uh, so that stories like Chris's um, don't arise into the future. So I will now hand over um, to our final contributor this morning who is Paul Olson who is Chief Counselor and Data Protection Officer um, at the Danish National Archives. And I think actually it, it'll be interesting. This contribution will be interesting because we've heard 
data protection um, coming up as an issue a lot over um, over the morning, just in terms of um, sometimes the conflict or the how do we reconcile our obligations under data protection with record keeping um, and protecting the public record in terms of their archival value. So I'm now going to hand over to Paul Olson. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if I can find out what uh, I, well, uh, to preserve the past control of the future because legislation, even archival legislation, is about trying to control the future for in some limited space for a limited period of time. And nowadays, things are moving along so fast that we can't have very uh, an archival act for very long before we have to change it. I should know this being part of the drafting of two sets of archival laws, which uh, uh, I was not present when the first one was drafted because it was in 1889, it lasted for 100 years. And since then, we have had about 25 amendments of two archival acts. So, um, what went wrong? Well, nothing really, I'll come back to that. But first, I think I should try to uh, go on and tell a little about myself and my life with archival legislation. Uh, first of all, I'll have you all knowing that I'm not a, a lawyer, but a historian. And uh, some from 40 years ago wrote a couple of papers in legal history and since lawyers used to be very scarce in the Danish National Archives I was suddenly landed with all the legal stuff in the archives and uh, was a secretary a member of two uh, committees who sat and drafted archival legislation uh, some 20 years ago. Um, and the core of the Danish, uh, the present Danish Archival Act is still the Act from 2002. And is, but now it is supplemented by supranational legis regulations. We didn't have those very much in 2002. There was a personal data di directive, the general data di protection regulation came uh, about 20 years after that. And the copyright directive followed right on. The public sector information directive also is an EU concoction. And now we are waiting for the European data governance regulation, which will have some impact on archives. And I'm not looking forward to the last one, uh, also for the reason that this is in fact my swan song as an archivist. I'll stop in a couple of weeks. Uh, but the thing is that in 1972, 1992, we had the first real archival act for a hundred years in Denmark. And this act regulated almost everything about public records, the organization of the public archive, state and municipal, creation of records, uh, active preservation by the creation agencies, the ownership to public record, it was ours, no doubt about that, uh, appraisal, delivery, and lastly, but not leastly, access. The access question, this is where the, the act be becomes very detailed. Uh, the thing about appraisal, preservation, uh, and all the archival stuff is very, very uh, broadly treated, but access was extremely detailed in its political, in the, by the political uh, bodies that took part in the drafting of the act. And this was in fact the political vehicle that uh, took the rest, that, that brought the rest home. So uh, the smart thing was really to have a comprehensive act that also took in those uh, data protection and access uh, rules and regulations that we were conscious of back then. Uh, the 
it lasted, as you will have been able to compute by now, uh, 10 years before it was due for a major revision, the act from 1992. So um, we started in 2000 at, uh, with a new drafting. And by then we had the EU data protection directive that contained a framework for the national data protection regulation. And the digital administration in Denmark was just about to end its beginning. And the meaning of data protection at that uh, time was reversed. It used to mean that you could protect data against misuse by deleting them. But uh, now you had to protect data so that they could be preserved for posterity and for historical and administrative use and things like that. And that means meant that we had uh, uh, some quite new uh, challenges that we still we had the paper administration and we had about uh, well half uh, uh, 500 sort of 500 kilometers of, of shelving lying out in the agencies and we had to reduce that and uh, things like that. But on top of that, we had to deal with the new digital records. As it was said earlier, we had uh, taken in databases, data sets since uh, 1970, but the new digital administration was something quite else than the old databases. Uh, we had the problems of dynamic documents and uh, spreadsheets and things that you at that time were not able to preserve for archival purposes. Uh, and at that time, for the first, uh, when we were working on the first uh, archival act, we still used to go out and appraise records that had been created two or three decades ago. And after all, paper is resilient and it takes time, kind of it takes some kind of physical effort to dispose of it, uh, and um, it's fairly simple to preserve uh, paper records. You should just see that they are not set fire to or kept in a dry place, and uh, keep the mice out, and uh, uh, then they will be there when you arrive to to. Uh, uh, find out if they're worth keeping. The uh, smart thing about the act of, two, uh, of 1992 in that respect was that it was enacted that the uh, agency in question should pay for the uh, work to, uh, for, for the uh, deletion of uh, superfluous records and the metadata creation and uh, all kinds of other things that you have to do to uh, present the archives with a nice set of records. Uh, if the agency in question was not able to do this itself, they could pay us to do it. And we made a lot of money that way. Uh, paper records, however, uh, takes up a lot of space as you all know. And for that reason, Appraisal was chief archival virtue under the 1992 Act. Not so in the digital age. And we found out in the uh, 1990s that the future is not going to stop just now. It keeps on coming for you, whether you're ready or not. And part of the future at that time was the digital record. And for instance, the media, the digital media at that time, we took all kinds of funny medias in floppy disks, 34 by 80 tapes, uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, it was very, uh, it was a tedious job to find out what kind of machine and what kind of program we should use to unravel the uh, information stored on those media. And uh, if we had waited to take the stuff in, we would probably find ourselves in possession of some uh, floppy disk with uh, uh, obsolete text 
program on it that we could not ever uh, expect to be reading. And then there's, of course, a still unsolved question what to do about the unofficial records that constitutes most of the administrative communication nowadays, emails, text messages, and uh, whatever people write each other on social media and things like that. Very little of the uh, digital record uh, the, 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 uh, of the digital communication consists of that uh, part that goes into the official record system. Uh, the smart thing about the digital records is that it does not take, take much of an effort to destroy the record. You could just leave it as it is, and then it will uh, go away by itself. And which means that you actually had to protect it for a while and after, and some part of the protective measures consist of legislation. And here I should add some praise to my uh, colleagues in the Danish administration for uh, as, uh, as a class, viewed as a class, the uh, Danish civil servants are rather law-abiding people, I must say that. So uh, it was uh, not hard to get them to understand that legislation is needed to protect the records and also to make them able to understand their superiors that record protection is important. But the two central paragraphs that protects the Danish public record is the, para uh, the paragraphs 8 and 10 of the Danish Archival Act of 2002. And they were made after the principle uh, that and some undersecretary in the uh, prime minister's department uh, told us that after clarity, unclarity is undoubtedly the best option. And uh, therefore, this, uh, it just says as authorities shall ensure the safeguarding of, cons safeguarding of consideration with respect to archives, including that records are kept in a satisfactory manner and uh, a rather obsolete uh, notion that, uh, that those records stored in electronic media shall be kept in such a manner that they can be transferred to public archives. And when the records are transferred, we in the public archives uh, take over the responsibility for the future preservation, which means that now we own them. They are ours. Uh, the two first uh, sections of the paragraph uh, uh, does not tell uh, anybody how to do this. And that is why we put in uh, a little mention of what we do we mean by preservation. And it turned out by the uh, more detailed regulations that the National Archi Archivist was empowered to, uh, to lay down, uh, that preservation is about every measure you can imagine concerning record keeping, uh, digital administration, whatever. And then we were given the role to supervise the compliance with our own rules which is, was rather nice, which of course meant that the uh, Danish Archival Act became a rather strong one, even seen in a European context. The National Archivist had in fact a lot of power con uh, when you compare him to some of the Central European ones, at least. And um, so the... <laughs> uh, the, the, the major task was to see that he did not abuse that power uh, because then it would have lasted very uh, shortly. Uh, oops, let's see if we was here. Uh, on the basis of two, those two paragraphs, we have uh, 
protected digital and paper records for uh, the uh, for the duration, and um, the, the 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 way in which we have done that is to standardize the uh, preservation of digital records. The uh, creative authorities are uh, kindly uh, asked to put the data that ought to be preserved into a standardized format, which means that we can migrate, migrate those data uh, to other formats automatically in the years to come, which means that uh, it does not cost us very much to uh, treat and preserve digital records as opposed to paper records where we still have to pay the rent for the buildings and uh, uh, things like that. But uh, the digital record, the digital administration, uh, the amount of data gathered by public and private organization and the uh, well, the, the ease with which, with, with which you can move digital information means that we have other problems to think about than the preservation. Uh, paper records uh, or paper records repositories forms a natural monopoly since nobody in their senses would try to think of a competing organization that could store, in our case, it's about 450,000 shelf meters or something like that, uh, which means that every Danish citizen had about nine centimeters of records to his or her name. Uh, as far as the technical preservation of public records go, the Danish Archival Act is not in acute need of revision, but then other things happened. The natural mon monopoly, as I told, disappeared with the paper-based administration, and uh, the concept of data ownership changed. Now the subject own uh, his or her data, uh, on, even though the physical media on which it is stored, that we may claim, claim so own ownership to that, the, uh, we are not in complete control of the data themselves. And um, this has made some challenges for us. And, e and data has been so, is, is a nice commodity. So if I quote from the Danish Agency for Data Supply and Efficiency, it's not the National Archives, it's another agency which tell us all that we use data like never before. We navigate our world with our trusty smartphone in hand while exercising, running watches and apps inform us if we have run faster or harder than on our last workout. This performance information help us plan our next training session so that we are always one step closer to achieving our goals. This, of course, is uh, individual data subjects property. And then we are told that the same applies to Denmark's public sector, where data about various themes ranging from excavations to climate and infrastructure help us to understand and monitor how our society is evolving. But these data are not stored and not disseminated by the Danish National Archives. They are held by the Danish Agency for Data Supply and Efficiency. And uh, if that was our only competitor, we could sleep fairly soundly, but they are not. Also, the Danish Health Data Authority is amassing health data from way back and uh, disseminating those in both an aggregate and individual uh, numbers. And Statistics Denmark is like other statistic department. I sort of heard that we are not the only ones with a statistical competitor on the market. And what will happen with um, all this new development in the administration in the creating agencies themselves? Uh, will the archives have to play a role in furnishing the society with 
the data that has been created by different, uh, like we used to do in the old days. People could come to us and see there was a railroad or a uh, gas works, or, and we would dive into the repositories, found, uh, find the case files and present the uh, wandering municipality or environmental agency with that information and everybody would be happy. Now we are not even asked. We can go and take the data from the agencies five years after they have been collected. We like to do that because then there might be somebody at the agency who knew what the data was used for, what it was about, how it was collected and such things. So we in fact have quite a lot of modern data, but they are not used by our customers. They are used by the customers of the uh, data suppliers elsewhere. The only thing that we have to offer where we still have our monopoly is the personal data. GDPR and all that have seen to that we here hold uh, that uh, the, the use of uh, personal data, personal information is restricted by the GDPR and national legislation to a degree. And we are the only body in inside the administration that can legally hold uh, uh, well non actual non uh, non uh, current information uh, that has been outdated or is found incorrect whatever and um, or is only of historical value for the time being and uh, that is what is left for us alone to do there is then the European Data Governance Act, which is about the reuse of public data and which, which will probably amend the GDPR in some, to some extent, so that the different creating or collecting agencies will be able to share their personal data with other agencies uh, of course, under safeguards and uh, privacy measures and uh, whatever. But the thing that is wrong with the European Data Governance Act, which is still just a draft, but it will come, is that the word archive is nowhere to be found in the draft of the act. This doesn't mean that it will have no impact on the archives. If the researchers, the uh, different agencies can uh, sort of create their own repositories for administrative uh, data. The role of the archives will change. We will maybe be reduced again to the nice depots of uh, antiquarian documents that we have been uh, collecting and treating and preserving. So what should we do about all that? Uh, as far as the GDPR goes, the archiving purposes for the public interest are exclusive. That means that one being transferred to an archive, the level of protection should be as high at is the, as if the data had been deleted. Deleting is uh, similar to archiving, and archiving is similar to deleting, at least in the sorts of the Danish uh, data put, uh, protection agency. And um, of course, uh, that gives us a privileged position, which is now probably being taken away from us. And what to do about that in a legislative manner? I think that we uh, suppose that the digital administration and communication are here to stay. Uh, the traditional archival legislation was widened its basis by taking in data protection in every sense of the word, also protection in the meaning of preserving. And archival purposes will also be due for a redefinition if the archive should intend to extend their business to other fields than the traditional service to historians and genealogists. And after all, under the present European supranational legislation, 
archival institutions are so far the only ones that can legally preserve and protect all kinds of data. But watch out for the Data Governance Act. The thing about archival legislation is that we should now try to think of what are the services that we can legitimately furnish our society and the members of the same with uh, to protect the rights of the citizens, to protect the rights of the state, to sort of even protect the possibilities of our um, pre of our those to follow us to do some research into the uh, strange times we are living through. Well, and so maybe the archive should think a little ahead at the role as it will be in about 20 years instead of, as I like to do, look back and say 20 years ago, it was all very much better. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Paul, and I think you're absolutely right um, that the archives really are about the future rather than the past. And it is if we're having conversations about reviews of legislation or changes in legislation, those big questions that you've posed in terms of the traditional role of a national archives and then this new data space, which is a contested space, as you clearly outline, in terms of those other competing institutions at national, but also at European level, that are also, um, uh, you know, that have governance within that space. So it is how a national archives um, can reconcile itself within that space, but also to be, and it, it harps back to our earlier discussion, which is the value that's placed on institutions like a national archives um, in terms of having those discussions around data and digital preservation into the future. Thank you so much to our four contributors this morning. I have found it absolutely fascinating. Um, the challenges are huge. Um, sometimes we we might think that um, a review of legislation or a change in legislation will be the magic bullet in a way that will, will solve all our problems. But actually listening to people who have very progressive legislation, that actually it's about the systems, it's about the processes, it's about the culture, it's about the values. But ultimately, everything that we're doing is about, um, it's about the citizen. It's about um, access. It's about um, accountability and openness in in terms of, of, of government um, and that relationship between government, the public sector and citizens. So we're now going to move, um, it's now 25 to 12, so we're now going to move to the next um, uh, part of the, the morning, which is to hear from um, the many people, over 300 people that have joined us here to this morning. Um, so thank you very much, all of you, because I know um, webinars are, are it's, a, it's a whole new world for us in terms of, of um, uh, format, etc. So not having questions at the end of each individual um, contribution. So we're going to take some questions now. I see that as part of the proceedings this morning, where questions were put into the Q&A room um, and, that, and that were specific to an individual contributor and I saw Stephen you were as busy earlier um, answering many questions that were particular to um, New Zealand. So I'm going to take up a number of questions now um, and um, I'll ask our contributors um, to uh, maybe answer some of those questions. Okay, so um, one of the questions we hear is, and this might be specific to the National Archives here, which is around, um, you know, public programmes, that, and actually it, 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 um, it echoes what, what uh, Paul was saying earlier just in relation to, um, uh, to Statistics Denmark and the relationship with um, uh, Danish um, archives. Um, but we've engaged in Ireland in really successful digitisation projects of um, um, the census of 1901 and the census of 1911. And there's a question here in relation to that if you, those massive digitisation projects that capture the public imagination, whether they then in turn um, might trivialise the role of a national archives in the public mind. Um, it's that historical versus the kind of the contemporary. So I might, um, Hugh, I might ask you that question just um, from a Scottish perspective as well and obviously, um, uh, yeah, from a Scottish perspective. 
Crikey, that's a question and a half. It is, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you guys can hear me okay. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I've got the answer to that question, to be honest with you. It's kind of well outside my realm, the whole issue of statistics. But there's an interesting um, uh, situation in Scotland in that the, 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 the keeper of the records of Scotland is also the general register of Scotland, the uh, general register office for Scotland, uh, chief executive. And so the National Records of Scotland also has um, uh, the registration role for Scotland. So we collect, uh, administer and collect the census material. So we have statistical information on hand as part of the keeper's remit, which is really quite interesting. I'm not sure if that's common uh, in other jurisdictions, but it's, it's, uh, it's really quite interesting here. And it's a young thing we only merged as organisations a few years ago. But I remember at the time the, the discussion was that this would be, you know, in the in the world that's coming, this would be quite a powerful tool. Um, mm. because the keeper would not only be the keeper of historical records, uh, but he would be the keeper of up-to-date data that could be used in an open way. It could be created, it could be used to exploit big data issues, it could be used to inform government about policy and the direction of its services and functions. Um, so it's a very powerful tool for the Keeper of the Exeter Scotland. I suspect we're maybe not just as, as far down the road with it as we could be. Um, but I think, it, from, my, from my perspective, it doesn't diminish the role of the National Archives within Scotland. We, the National Records of Scotland is now in control of vast amounts of really important data, which is central to government. Uh, and its decision-making process. And that provides us with a very powerful tool, actually. Um, um, so I, I, would, I would argue that it doesn't diminish the role of the archives. I think it actually provides us with a, uh, a, an increased visibility. Thank you very much, Hugh. I might come to you, Niamh, um, because I, I rather suspect that the question was specific to the National Archives here and the digitisation of the 1901 and the 1911 census. I'd agree with you. I think you, uh, the visibility that the census digitisation project gave to the National Archives is really, really valuable. Um, and I think you also have to understand that our National Archives has a dual function. Preservation and access are key to what we do as well. So, you know, taking in the records is only the first part of the process. It's actually processing them and making them available to researchers. And obviously, uh, you know, technology, being able to digitise records and make them available online has, it just makes them a lot more user friendly and a lot more uh, accessible to people, not just in, in Dublin, all across Ireland and all across the world. You know, the user profile of our census website demonstrates that the interest is vast and it's, it's, it's from all areas of the world that uh, Irish people have ended up in. Um, and so I, I don't think you can, um, I don't think it has a, a negative impact. I think in terms of our profile in, in Ireland, um, the issue is in terms of the legislation and uh, the, 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 the fact that we, we don't have a statutory function in records management. So that's where our profile has been reduced. But um, I don't think you can uh, undermine our um, the, the, the profile that we've 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 gotten and the the accessibility that our our users have have gotten from the the census project and obviously the 2026 digitization project is going to be a massive project for us which again uh, will you know give, uh, presents huge opportunities to us in how um, technology has advanced even in the last 10 years and how we can present that information to people uh, over the coming years. Okay, thank you, Niamh. Um, I'm going to move on because there are a number of questions queuing up um, in the Q&A room. We have one here in relation to public records legislation, space for charters that define the type of information the public can expect to be archived about them, be it in education or civil registration, etc. Um, public records legislation is often very dry, um, dull but worthy, but a way to make it real for the public could be to relate it very openly to being about their data. So that's that's taking archival legislation and reconcile it with with in the kind of the data protection piece. Um, Paul, I might come to you on that. Oh, well. <laughs> um, yes, it's... Um, it's 
Yes, well, it's, uh, we archive all kinds of information on any uh, Danish individual. So um, uh, we have both education, civil administration, social, economic, health, uh, court of death, whatever uh, that is collected by the, uh, the, the, the public authorities. Uh, what we are missing is not uh, information about the individual citizens or subjects of our glorious queen, but the thing we are missing is, in fact, uh, the information about uh, infrastructure and uh, climate, and uh, because that's mostly collected by private enterprises. Uh, but uh, no, I don't think there's, uh, 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 that we sh we have, maybe we should try to, to imagine how a charter could look. But um, the thing about public records uh, uh, and its legislation is that public records are in fact dull. Uh, dollar than most other things, but um, the thing is that when you begin to read them and unravel their stories and the information they contain, they can be made alive, just like census information, which is also very dry. But uh, no, uh, um, we have uh, uh, just had an amendment of the archive law in Denmark, which gives every citizen right to uh, to have an insight in their own hyphenated data. I... Yes. I don't know if it answered, but um, I'm a little doubtful, but. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, Actually, Stephen, I might go to you on that, just reconciling yes. the um, archival legislation, public record legislation with data protection and, and, and records as they relate to the individual and the role of a, of a national archives in, 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 and trying to reconcile that rather difficult role. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it, it is a very contested space and an interesting area. Uh, uh, one quick thing I wanted to, I'll, I'll come to that in a second, but one of the things I wanted to mention was that quite a few questions have come about in conversation around third parties holding information uh, on behalf of government. In our legislation, um, the section 17, which is the section which says that all public offices must create and maintain full and accurate records um, according to normal prudent business practice, including any matter contracted out. So within the New Zealand context, any public uh, body which contracts out a function must keep full and accurate records as part of the public record. So that should be set out in any contractual arrangements with third parties. So that does bleed over quite a bit into that, that, uh, that, that contested space over what, what goes into privacy and who owns those records and um, and what the, the ownership relationship is, which for us adds a little extra complexity to that. But um, what I would say is we, um, one of the advantages, I guess, of not, no longer being a standalone agency in Archives New Zealand here within the uh, Department of Internal Affairs is that one of my colleagues is the Privacy Commissioner, one of my colleagues is the, uh, the person that's uh, responsible for digital identity for, for government and, uh, and others that are responsible for other bits of the government data, data system. So we can actually just, I can just go out and you know, go, up a, go across the precinct and up a floor and, and go and speak to my colleagues about some of these issues and, 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 and work some of them out between us and help to influence that. But certainly one of the things I've been thinking about is the role of, of a, if, you, if you're aware of the Estonian model where you have a shared um, government citizen identity and starting to look at how we could have a shared uh, government identity and, and access to the records. And one of the things I've been talking to about my Australian colleagues, which was which has happened over there, and the fallout of their of their uh, abuse and state care cases that, that that Hugh talked about, and which we're going through right now here in New Zealand, and there's pressure here to to answer that question: is what what would legislation look like uh, where it was not just the public. 
uh, interest or the, or the public office that was responsible for those records, but the subject of the records had rights and responsibilities over their, th those records as a shared responsibility with government. And that's something that is beginning to be grappled with in Australia um, because of the, the, those, the, those things that we've spoken about uh, that's been highlighted by Abuse and State Care and something that the interim report and the Royal Commission is pointing to us at Archives New Zealand, something that I know will be coming to us in the next year or so. So we're, we're starting to think about that right now. And we've got some complexity in our law. I don't know if it made the news, but uh, in Europe, but um, uh, a river in New Zealand became got rights to being a natural person and has uh, rights and responsibilities under um, environmental law. And that, 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 and we're also looking at how EWI, EWI, which are tribal groups, can have rights to data to move away from that Eurocentric of one individual to the state and actually groups of people having rights over their records. Um, uh, because of course, there's a very asymmetrical relationship between an individual and the state. So how can groups like patient groups, for example, or tribal groups or, you know, uh, or broader groups have rights over their information and records to counterbalance that asymmetrical relationship with the state. And I, I think it's a really interesting area. I don't necessarily have any answer for it, but I think it's an area where, where answers are beginning to emerge. And I know that it's, it's, uh, in the Estonian context that, that's, that's beginning to happen, but it's also beginning to happen in Australia. And I think we'll be grappling with it here in New Zealand pretty shortly as well. So perhaps more, questions and answers there but um, I'm not sure that globally anyone has really nailed that currently. Yeah yeah thank you very much Stephen. Hugh I might um, come to you there's a question specifically for you um, but it was referenced um, by all the speakers and the emphasis on the implementation of EDRMS throughout the public sector in Scotland has become less prescriptive and the question really is what's influenced the thinking here? The, the thinking of, of not prescribing EDRMS, is that the question? Yes, yes, that's the question. Um, well, um, in Scotland, under the Public Records Act, that there is, we cannot prescribe that, that an authority uses any particular system. Um, it was very clear at the bill stage of developing the legislation that public authorities did not want government telling them what systems that they should use to manage and create the records that they would routinely create. In fact, they didn't want government telling them what records they should create. That needs to be, and it was agreed at that point, that that needs to be um, a business decision for the authorities themselves. They know best what records they need to create, and they need to be in a position to choose what systems they need in order to create and manage those records. I think that's a sensible way forward. I think it would be, personally, I think it would be wrong for the, the national um, uh, National Records of Scotland or, or the, the Keeper of the Records of Scotland to be directing public authorities unilaterally on what systems they should use. Um, so um, so it, it's, it's an org it has always been organic. Um, there, is, there is a bit of a mess, if I'm being honest, about the public sector in relation to the sorts of systems that are in place. Some are still using paper records. Some have got shared network drives, some have got EDRMSs, we're now, now moving in large numbers towards Microsoft 365. Um, there are all sorts of issues and challenges around that, but I think um, under the legislation that we have, it's an obligation on the authorities to ensure that whatever systems they use to manage their records, they are able to manage them appropriately and robustly, and they have to be able to evidence that under their records management plan and the arrangements that they set out under that. So, and it's important for us to be able to scrutinize that. And so we need to see the evidence from authorities about how they are managing their records under Microsoft 365, for example, which is where a lot of our local authority colleagues and NHS colleagues are currently going. Um, but uh, similarly, if they're managing it under an old shared network drive, we need to see how they're doing that. We need to see if they can have, um, a robust business classification scheme around those drives? Do they have proper retention mechanisms in place to account for all the records that are on it? Do they have records on standalone systems? Do they have access databases which are now out of date, but do, do, do they have them? And if they have them, are they managing them appropriately? So it, it's, there is no one size fits all here. I think authorities need to have the ability, the flexibility to be able to bring on board systems which allow them to manage the records which they need to be able to create for their own business purposes in a way that suits their business model. 
Uh, and there's a massive resource issue here as well. And we're working in a public sector at the minute which has no money. Um, so it would be inappropriate, I think, for public uh, for, for public sectors to be told they have to do things and uh, use systems of a particular system. So I think it's appropriate that it works the way it works currently. Um, but I think that all authorities need to be able to uh, uh, evidence how they make those systems work uh, best they can for protecting the records that they have a duty to protect. Thank you very much. Um, Paul, there's a question here um, in relation to the changing role of the archives service. And would you and the other contributors see, for example, archives taking a central role in setting standards and providing advice on, on record keeping in a world where archives and records are more dispersed or unlikely to be centrally held? So, Paul, you might start. And then if anybody else wants to come in, I can see you all on the screen here. So just raise your hand, Stephen, Hugh and Niamh. I think it's uh, it's the thing that the National Archives uh, ought to consider. Is that something that we should want to do just to keep with you know, with the times? Because that this is the new black, that is a data uh, brokerage, if you could call it that. Uh, we are in fact central place to know where the uh, where records are where information. Uh, and records are collected and treated and used. And uh, traditionally best place to uh, advise other people how you could reuse this information. Uh, so, we're, but we will, of course, as most, as uh, if I take the, the average National Archive, need a couple of uh, competent, uh, there are some competences that we need to find out. For instance, we're not great on health data. We need some medical <laughs> uh, knowledge to uh, be able to advise fully on that. We are not great on geological data. We need a little, and that's why those specialties crop up around us. But uh, we are just as good as the statistical departments, usually. Uh, <laughs> So I think that we should very much consider to, to place uh, uh, whatever information that we have at, in, at, uh, in the context. How was it collated? What was the original use? Which, is, uh, which will probably be very important for the reuser to know so that you can in fact make an appraisal of the value of the information that were collected for other purposes to see if it fits your own. Uh, or else you will, we have seen uh, in my country instances where this, uh, where this uh, a, a, a mistakes about how, what data was really, uh, really about has led to, well, I think we killed a lot of mink recently, uh, <laughs> which, was simply because we were not really sure about what the information was about how, and how it could be used. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, I'm just, there's one here specific to New Zealand. Um, is the question of AI software, um, robot, legal person right also emerging? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, um, the, the way that we are, we're managing um, AI um, and New Zealand governments through the algorithm charter. So it's where government uh, agencies sign up to the, the, the controls and the responsibilities are around explainability for using algorithms within government policy and within a government context. Um, uh, as far as uh, legal rights of, of the robots themselves, we've, we've not broached that particular issue, but within Within Archives New Zealand, what we're using AI for is looking at auto classification for um, for um, EDRMS type systems, Microsoft 365, um, retroactively uh, meta tagging and classifying content post transfer when it's when it's not well categorized, when retention disposal, um, security, um, Maori data sovereignty, and other classifications haven't been applied. Uh, we're also using AI to, um, uh, well, we're using a European tool, Transcribus, to capture handwriting um, uh, so that that can be uh, text mined and searched. 
So I would say that AI, um, well, actually, probably not so much AI, but machine learning has been used quite a bit. Um, and, and we do use robots, for example. Um, we archive the whole of the .co.nz domain. Um, and yeah. we, we have an agreement with um, internet, um, the Internet Archive so that people can access the, all the government websites for the last 30 years, for example, so that that information isn't lost to the New Zealand context. So we certainly use machine learning and we use robots and AI. But as far as that, um, recognising it's having rights in a record-keeping sense, we, we don't do that. But if you are interested, if you search for algor algorithm charter, uh, govt.nz, you can go and have a look at uh, the government guidance, um, which is which is discretionary. But I think about 20 or 30 government agencies have signed up um, and committed to meeting the requirements of, um, of ethical AI within government. Um, I think we are we are quite advanced in this area in New Zealand. Mm, um, mm. Perhaps not as far as uh, Canada, uh, that seem to be a little bit ahead of everybody, but um, and France to to a lesser extent. But um, we're certainly using those tools. And and the, and the example I would use is that anyone that uses an Apple product, uh, when was the last time you actually filed anything? You know, the auto classification has been in our pocket for 15, 20 years. It, it's not new technology. And uh, we should just be using it a lot more for um, record keeping systems. Great. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, it is now 12 o'clock, so we've come to the end of this morning's session. Um, and thank you to all those who contributed questions as part of the Q&A. Um, just uh, leaves it to me really to say thank you very much to our contributors um, for their time this morning, but also the amount of, 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 of expertise and experience that they brought to their presentations has been really fascinating from our perspective and I hope for the 300 odd people that um, that stayed with us throughout the morning, which I think is an absolute indictment really of the, the, uh, the, uh, the quality of the contributions um, this morning. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to Neve MacDonnell, um, to Stephen Clark, to Hugh Hagen and to Paul Olson and Paul to wish you all the best um, on your departure from Danish archives in the next number of weeks um, and to thank everybody uh, again just for tuning in this morning. Uh, thank you all very much.